Welcome back, listeners, to Sandman Stories Presents, a folklore podcast where I read you to sleep or until the next story. I'm your host, Dustin. This is the first story in my Halloween series. I had already recorded and edited a few ghost stories when I was presented with an amazing opportunity. A writer and folklore collector in Ecuador named Mario Conde gave me his permission to read aloud the stories he had collected. So this is dedicated to him and to the Pesante family in Guayaquil who opened their home to me. Today's story is called Vico and the Duende. Duende is translated into the word imp, but it is a common spirit in both Spanish-speaking countries and also in the Philippines for colonial reasons. This is a story about a boy named Vico who stays out late playing marbles, his grandma, and a marble-playing duende. And apologies if I get any of the pronunciations wrong. I'm trying my best. But if you would like to correct me, go ahead and send me a message. Tell me I messed up. I'm glad to correct it. Okay, let's begin. Vico and the Duende Huambalo is a small rural village in the county of Peleleo, not far from the town of Baños de Agua Santa. Back in the old days, there was a ravine there known as Gualachuco. The locals said the ravine was cursed because it was there at the bottom, in the swirls and eddies of the creek that ran through it, where the Duende lived. The residents of Huambalo avoided going near the ravine after six o'clock in the afternoon, the hour when that creature from hell, the son of demons, would leave the ravine to chase people, especially bad children, who played marbles in the street until late at night. In the town lived a ten-year-old boy everyone called Vico. The boy loved to stay out late, playing with his tops and marbles in the street, and he never came home until it was already dark. His grandmother, mindful of her grandson, was always looking for him and advising him to straighten up, that if he stayed a tramp and a miscreant, one day the duende would come and take him away. Vigo never paid any attention to her warnings until one afternoon, when he was returning home, he met a strange man, much smaller than normal. The little man wore a huge, wide-brim black hat, like the one mariachi musicians wear. His face was sooty and hairy, and he wore a big red poncho. His feet were tiny, but his hands were enormous and deformed, and in these great hands he rolled around a fistful of marbles. A shudder went through the boy when he saw the man, but instead of quickly running away, Vico went to get a better look at the brilliantly colored marbles. The man invited him to play, and Vico, his eyes bright with greed, accepted. It was getting dark, so the two went to shoot marbles behind a store located next to the ravine that had an outdoor light for those who came to shop there after dark. Vico drew a circle on the ground, and they set up marbles and began to play. The boy won the first games because he was a very skilled player. However, after a few losses, the little man in the big hat, his hairy face full of rage, rearranged the back of his red poncho and... As if by magic, his luck began favoring him. Vico did not win again, and in just a few games he was left without a single marble. The duende put the marbles in a little leather pouch he had on his belt and began to walk towards the young boy, as if to catch him with his big gnarly hands. Vico shuddered and felt the demon was closing in on him, but luckily he heard a familiar voice the voice of his grandmother getting closer. The boy was greatly relieved and he went to leave, but not before telling the duende that he wanted a rematch the next night. The little demon, hidden in the darkness, tipped his hat in acceptance. Vico's grandmother arrived and took him back to their home. That night, the boy dreamed that the evil one, El Diablo himself, was carrying him away on a black stallion. He awoke several times, frightened and screaming. In the morning, he wanted to tell his grandmother everything that had happened, but he kept quiet because she would have made a huge fuss about it, probably dragging him down to the church straight to the fountain of holy water. Besides, if he told her, 
she would never let him keep the appointment he had with the duende that night, and he was prepared to do whatever it took to win his marbles back, even if he had to trick the devil himself to do it. After school, he spent the whole afternoon in the patio practicing shooting marbles. When it started to get dark, he left the house and went straight to the church. He snuck in, dipped his marbles in the bowl of holy water, and put them away again. He left, crossing himself, and walked towards the ravine to keep his appointment. The duende was there, waiting in the shadows, his face hidden under the enormous black hat, holding his leather bag. Without a word, Vico drew the playing circle, and they began the game anew. Just like the night before, Vico won the first few games, and the duende, his eyes beginning to pop out of his head in anger, once again rearranged the back of his red poncho. This time, however, the little demon's luck did not change. His aim seemed to be terrible. He was even missing short-range shots. He would shoot directly at one of Vico's marbles, but the holy water would cause the imp's marble to miss or stop completely, only a few centimeters short of its target. When it was Vico's turn, he would calmly aim his shooting marble, and it would never miss. The duende beat the ground, kicked, swore, and lost every one of his brightly colored marbles. The little duende's face was so red with rage. Somehow, this boy had tricked him and escaped his trap. As for Vico, he was proud of his victory and he wanted more. He wanted to win the little leather pouch where the duende kept his marbles and offered to wager ten marbles against it. The duende gleefully accepted. Vico won again, but this time the duende was not angry, for although he had lost the marbles and the pouch, he had won something far more valuable. The boy's soul. The duende approached the boy once again with his big, gnarled hands outstretched. In the darkness, his red eyes flickered like flames. Terrified, Vico backed up, as if pushed towards the ravine by the duende. He wanted to cry for help, but it felt as if there was a hand clasped over his mouth. Terror ran through his body. He broke out in a cold sweat, and his heart was beating so furiously it felt as if it would leap out of his chest. Fear clouded his vision. Just when he thought he was doomed and was about to faint, he saw a figure approaching him, looking like an angel, coming with something held in its hands. It was his grandmother again. The old woman held a whip and a bottle of moonshine in one hand and a pack of cigarettes in the other. She set the alcohol and cigarettes down on the ground near the duende. Duende, duende, do you want the moonshine or the whip? She bellowed threateningly. The duende snatched the moonshine and cigarettes and vanished in a puff of smoke, leaving nothing behind but the faint smell of sulfur. When he was gone, Vico, skin pale, hair standing on end, and foam coming from his mouth, collapsed, his body racked by convulsions. His grandmother called for help, and immediately all the people of Huambalo neighborhood came out of their nearby homes. Someone brought a strong ointment, and they held it under the boy's nose and rubbed it onto his belly and forehead, while one of the neighbors repeated the Ave Maria prayer. The boy slowly recovered. It had been a close call, and the duende had almost gotten him. The next morning, Vico was amazed to discover that he still had the little leather pouch in his pocket. He opened it anxiously, but he did not find the marvelous multicolored marbles inside. Instead, the pouch only held small round pellets of goat dung. The End
Wow, I love this story. The places in the story are real, and the little stream can be found on a map of Ecuador near the city of Pelaleo. It's up in the Andes. I love how Grandma stepped in at the end and gave the Duende an offer he couldn't refuse. Granny is definitely the hero of the story. And I love that Vico got all excited about pulling out the little leather pouch, only to find a goat's cocoa pebbles. That was just beautiful. So, don't stay out late, and don't play marbles with the devil. You'll only wind up with goat poop. Next week's story will be The Woman on the Highway and The Skeleton's Bridegroom. Both are spooky, but nothing too graphic. Once again, gracias Mario Conde, gracias Ecuador, and thank you very much, dear listeners. Buenas noches, and happy Halloween. Today we have another story from the Ecuadorian Ghost Stories by Mario Conde. This one is called The Dead Horseman, and it's about a lot of fighting and some murders and all like that, but the reason I'm adding it in is because it mentions the Day of the Dead, which is not Halloween. The Day of the Dead is an ancient practice that was adopted by the Catholic Church, but it has no relation to Halloween. It is a day for remembering your dead and keeping up the memories of those who have recently passed. So this one is called The Dead Horseman, and it's from the El Porvenir Manabi area. Okay, let's begin. The Dead Horseman Narciso Zombrano was an incorrigible womanizer. One Sunday, walking around the ranch where he was employed as a caretaker, he saw a lovely woman seated on the banks of the river near the edges of a neighboring ranch. He could tell right away that she was married, but temptation proved more powerful than prudence, and he went to go talk with her. It was for good reason that he had a reputation as a seducer. He bedded her that very day and continued to see her every Sunday thereafter. The woman's name was Felicia Paz, and her husband's was Celso Calpa. The couple had a small farm where they cultivated crops and raised livestock, and so Celso went to town every Sunday to sell their produce in the market. As for Felicia, she was naturally unsociable and melancholy and preferred to stay home. Celso, used to his pretty wife's moods, never made her come with him. One day in the market, Celso was chatting with some friends, and one of them insinuated that his wife never came along because she was being kept busy by someone else on the banks of the river. Celso went mad with rage, took out his revolver, and nearly shot the offending man. He decided instead to put the rumors to rest and saddle up his horse, a beautiful black steed, and went back to his farm. As he went, he felt the sharp nagging claws of jealousy dig deeply into his skin. He reached a decision. If he caught his wife cheating on him, he would kill both her and her lover on the spot. The couple was enjoying the tranquility of the place when suddenly they heard the violent shouting and the approaching gallop of a horse. Startled, Felicia saw her husband atop his horse brandishing a gun. Narciso, who was as skilled with guns as he was with women, took out his own revolver but didn't fire right away. As the horsemen approached at full speed, the two rivals eyed each other defiantly, measuring each other's resolve. Each fixed his gaze on the weapon of the other, and then, the conclusion. Two booming gunshots in the whinny of the horse as the rider tumbled to the ground. Felicia burst into hysterical sobs and ran to her husband's side. Before he died, Celso Calpa threw her a furious look that seemed to say he would be back from the other side to take his vengeance. The murder changed the lives of the lovers into hell. Felicia fled with Narciso to an isolated estate. There they spent their days blaming each other for the tragedy. At night, they were haunted by nightmares of the dead husband, mounted on his black horse, riding after them with diabolical fury in his eyes. Their nerves were on edge, and they jumped every time they heard a horse whinny or a gallop past. 
They would go to the window with fear, but there was never anyone there, neither man nor beast. They thought that they were going insane since the galloping and the whinnying and the angry shouting that occasionally accompanied the sounds of the horse were becoming more and more frequent, but no one else seemed to hear them. They began to think that perhaps one of Cetosil's relatives followed them there and was trying to frighten them. Their doubts about whether the horrible noises were caused by somebody from this world or the next were settled on the 2nd of November, the Day of the Dead. In little towns of the coast, people believe that if someone leaves this world with unfinished business, he or she will return on the Day of the Dead to resolve it. Because of the heat, people usually visit cemeteries at night, and not in the morning like people do in the rest of the country. That night, the couple did not leave the house where they were hiding, preferring to stay as far away as possible from any place that had anything to do with the dead. The heat that night was unbearable, and the moon bathed the countryside in light. They were in the midst of trying to figure out who might be tormenting them when they heard the gallop of a horse in the distance. Felicia jumped up, fearing that something terrible was about to happen. Narciso went to the window, but no one was there. Silence. An agonizing silence, so complete that the couple could not even hear the nighttime song of the crickets. Terrified, the two lovers looked at each other, not daring to say a word. Suddenly, they heard again the sounds of galloping and a hoarse shouting, which, as on the day of the crime, were getting closer and closer. Inside, the couple shook with fear. Outside, the beast's hooves pounded violently on the bamboo walls of the cabin. The fragile walls shook and threatened to collapse, and in the midst of the noise and confusion, the whinnying of a horse rang out. The lovers could not take any more, and pushed their way out of the little cabin, screaming in terror. Desperate, Narciso and Felicia ran off towards the cemetery, where they knew the townspeople were gathered. They had not gone far in their mad dash when they heard the terrifying galloping following them. Narciso turned to look, and this time could just make out an eerie figure in the shape of a horse and a rider. The horse was glossy and black and blew fire from its nostrils. The specter of the rider, the dead horseman, was nothing more than an ash-gray shadow, letting out ragged shouts with a voice that seemed to come from beyond the grave. Narciso went mad with fear at the sight of the phantom and ran as fast as he could, leaving the woman behind to face her fate. The night became all shadow, thicket, horror. Narciso didn't know how far he had gone until he neared the cemetery, and the presence of other people brought him back to his wits. It was only then that he realized Felicia had been left behind. At that moment, he heard horrible screams from the road behind him. They were the screams of a woman. Felicia's lifeless body was found in front of the siebo tree, her face twisted into a grim mask of horror. She was scraped and bruised, as if she had been dragged behind a horse. That same afternoon, Narciso left the estate, still in the grip of a deranged fear. He was unrecognizable. He looked lost and lifeless. He talked to himself and every now and then he would look over his shoulder as if someone was following him. Not a trace was left of the incorrigible womanizer he once was. He had grown old over a single night, and on his face registered a terror reserved for those condemned to death. He fled from the phantom of the dead horseman, which he deliriously said would pursue him until it took his revenge. He wandered through different small towns but never found any peace, for, wherever he went, he heard that fearsome gallop and those infernal cries. Occasionally desperation lent him courage, and he would stand firm, attempting to confront the being from the other side. But he would only hear the gallop of hooves and feel the icy breeze which chilled him from head to toe. Narciso understood that the dead horseman would not return until the next November 2nd, the Day of the Dead, the one day of the year when the dead are able to return. The certainty of knowing when the horseman would come for him made Narciso senselessly passive and listless. He let the time slip by as if it were water in a river. 
At the end of October, a few days before the date, he began his return to the ranch where he had committed the crime, having decided to face his destiny. Narciso returned to El Porvenir on the morning of November 2nd. He didn't speak to anyone, but went straight to the town's community house, where he knew the deputy mayor would be. When the deputy saw the vagabond, prematurely aged and with a lost look in his eyes, he took him for a madman. His suspicions were confirmed when the man told him that he had come to turn himself in for the murder of Celso Calpa. The deputy was about to throw him out, but the crazy old man looked at him pleadingly and explained who he was. Only then did the officer of the law recognize him. It was in fact the same Narciso Zambrano, the womanizer who had seduced the wife of Celso Carpa and fled with her after murdering him. Nevertheless, the man looked like someone else. Remorse had devastated him. No investigation was necessary. Narciso Zambrano confessed to the murder, and the deputy, almost embarrassed by how eager the murderer was to be locked up, put him in a small cell in the community house. Once inside, the prisoner seemed to let go of the guilt that had haunted him and curled up on a straw mattress there in the cell. For the first time in a very long time, he slept soundly. He awoke at about five o'clock in the afternoon. The deputy brought some food, and Narciso ate hungrily, as if he had not had a bite to eat for a very long time. The appearance of the prisoner had changed. He now seemed like a calm, rational man. Admitting to the murder had cleared some things up, but the deputy was curious about the fate of the woman. What happened to Celso's wife, he asked. She died, the prisoner said sadly. You murdered her too? I didn't kill her, Narciso responded. It was the ghost of her husband. The answer disturbed the deputy. He decided that the prisoner was out of his mind, so he stopped asking questions and went to leave. When he saw that the deputy was getting ready to leave, a sudden terror gripped Narciso. He jumped from the mattress and begged the deputy not to leave him alone, pleading that he could not be left alone, at least not that night. May I ask why? the deputy asked. Because it's the day of the dead, Narciso Zambrano replied. The one night of the year when the ghost of the man I murdered can return for vengeance, and he might come for me. That's why I turned myself in to escape his revenge. Maybe now he won't come for me. The deputy didn't pay him any attention. Don't leave me alone, Narciso pleaded, crying like a baby. Don't leave me alone to the wrath of that monster from beyond. I left Felicia behind and he killed her. There is no such thing as ghosts, the policeman shouted, exasperated. This dead horseman is all in your head, you coward. If you're so frightened, I'll stop by here later on my way to the cemetery. Narciso waited anxiously, agonizingly, as only a dying man could. When it was completely dark, the sounds of the town people outside ceased, and only the imperceptible noises of nocturnal insects and birds could be heard in the town. The prisoner rested in his cell, stretched out on a straw mattress. Around nine o'clock, without the harrowing silence that had preceded the previous encounters, he heard the terrifying gallop once again. The blood-curdling noise brought Narciso to his feet, screaming for help. Less than a minute later, he sensed the door of the community house open. It was the end. He was sure of it. A bright light flashed across his face. Calm down, man, a familiar voice said. It was the deputy, shining a flashlight on him while he lit a lamp. The prisoner came back to life when the light brightened the room. He was pale and his face was bathed in a cold sweat. He collapsed onto the straw mattress and began to cry like a baby. You're safe here, the deputy said, feeling sorry for the terrified man. I'll stay here and watch over you. I wouldn't want you to die of fright before you have the chance to face justice. Narciso regained his calm, but it only lasted for a few instants, because suddenly the galloping and hoarse shouts from beyond the grave surrounded the community house. The prisoner went mad with fear again. The deputy, alarmed, went to the window to see what was going on. Horror washed over him. 
he saw a figure in the shape of a horse and a rider approaching the community house at full speed. The man crossed himself and began to pray out loud. But something strange occurred at that moment. Suddenly, the prisoner, who had been looking through the window of his cell, stopped screaming and his agitated breathing slowed and began to return to normal. Outside, the specter of the dead horseman stopped at the front of the community house. The policeman was trembling. Narciso Zambrano watched serenely. The diabolical animal reared up, let out one last roaring whinny, made a half turn, and disappeared into the night. Finally, that tormented soul has found peace, the prisoner said. Narciso Zambrano had been hunted by the specter for so long that when he saw it approaching the community house, he knew it would not cause him any harm. The deputy, on the other hand, had goosebumps and wanted to return home as soon as he could before it got too late and there was no one around. He hurried to leave. The prisoner, who had regained his wits, did not mind. After the policeman left, Narciso Zambrano reclined on his mattress and, breathing easily, crossed his arms on his chest. Just as he began to drift off to sleep, he once again suddenly felt a cold breeze, which chilled him from head to toe. When he opened his eyes, he saw a dark figure in front of him, a different phantom figure that stared at him frightfully. Struck mute with horror, Narciso Zambrano felt the apparition, which he could see now was covered with bruises, as if she had been dragged behind a horse, wrap her ghostly hands around his neck, and choked him to death. The End Wow. Um, I like that ending. First, because the, the husband had found peace, but then second, because Felicia had not been avenged. You know, he just, he just left her. He's like, yeah, love you and leave you. Okay, see ya. And left her to die. I'm so glad that she came back to get him. That was just a beautiful ending. And again, I picked this one to show that Day of the Dead and Halloween are not the same holiday. Day of the Dead in Ecuador is from the Incas, and it's about celebrating your dead, and then it combined with a church holiday, and they kind of mash the two of them together, as, as the church often does. There's also one in Mexico that combines an Aztec ceremony of remembering the dead and combines it with the church. The Druidic Tradition of Sawain, that one has nothing to do with Day of the Dead. Now, they do occur in the, the same time on the calendar, but that's the end of <laughs> their coincidences. And there's a lot of interesting stuff. Some people say Dia de los Muertos, Dia de la Muerte. There, there's different ways of saying it. I know I'm probably butchering it because I don't speak Spanish and I'm not particularly connected to the culture's but here in the original Spanish of the book, they call it Dia de Defuntos. So that's another way to say it. And thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Mario Conde, for letting me read your stories. Thank you, Ecuador, for being such a wonderful place. I can't wait to go back. And I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful Halloween spooky season. And I hope you remember those who have passed. Thank you, and good night.